we are ready to get started. I'm going to be going kind of quickly because we only have 20 minutes. So hopefully you'll still get a lot out of this and I'm not going so fast as uh, to kind of not um, explain some of the core concepts here. But I'm going to be talking about building full stack social applications today. And we're going to be combining a presentation at the beginning with an actual coding demo at the end. And the team that I work with is Ave and Lens Protocol. And Lens Protocol specifically is what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm Nader. I've been a developer for about 11 years, worked in the traditional tech world in cloud and mobile, and then have now been in the blockchain world for a little over two years. Um, if you want to get a reference to the resources we're covering here today, I'll give you a couple of minutes if you want to scan this QR code. Uh, if you want a lens handle, by the way, also come by the booth today. We can get you set up with one. If you want uh, some swag, uh, come talk to us. We have a lot of swag there. We're trying to mainly uh, get that swag to people that are building on lens or go. Um, but if you come like maybe tomorrow and we still have some swag left and you're not yet building uh, on lens or go and we, you can still pick some up. But um, if you are building on lens or go, definitely come, come speak to us. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna first introduce Lens. So what is Lens? Speaking to developers here, I'm gonna give a different um, description than what Lens is to like a user. For a user, you could kind of think of it as a like social layer for Web3 or just really a composable social graph that allows you to take your identity and your followers across multiple applications and multiple experiences. But for developers, I could say it's more of like a protocol and a suite of tools and APIs for easily building social apps or integrating social features into existing apps. The way I like to kind of describe this that might resonate with traditional software engineers, it's kind of like a managed service offers features like Auth0 or Okta might uh, offer authentication for you for your application. You don't have to build all that from scratch. You just tie into something like Clerk or Auth0 and you're good to go. You have things like S3 for file storage. You have um, even, I don't know, there's there's all sorts of these managed services out there like Twilio for messaging. You can think of Lens Protocol as a managed service for building social applications or social features into existing apps. So you don't have to build or manage this backend infrastructure. It's all there for you. You just build out the front end, either a web or a mobile app. And social is really interesting because it's kind of the biggest use case that there is in software today, I think. Um, 4.9 billion people are familiar with social. It's not like a lot of other blockchain technologies where there's a lot of onboarding and friction for people to have to understand like why they would use this in the first place. It's just something that people are already knowing and understanding as well. And I think it's also interesting to see the two biggest social founders in the history of the world, Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey, also moving into decentralized social. Jack with Blue Sky, who then moved on to with Nostra, and now you see Adam Masseri, who's the head of both Instagram and Threads, giving a talk at TED last year, talking about building decentralized social applications. And then one of his first posts on Threads is talking about how Threads is moving into a decentralized network. And some of the language he's using here is Web3 language, portable social graphs, censorship resistance are some of the themes here in, in one of his first posts. And I think it's really interesting and validating for anyone here that's been building in Web3 to kind of see that these ideas in practice actually do make a lot of sense. And I think when applied to social, it makes especially a lot of sense. And hopefully you can see why by the end of this uh, talk. So a social application doesn't necessarily mean an Instagram or a TikTok. It just means that you're implementing a feature that has some type of social functionality into your app. As developers, what are some applications that we might not think of as social that are social? Well, GitHub is a very good example of this. I don't use GitHub only for storing code. I use GitHub for discovery of new APIs and new applications and new software that the people I follow are building because I can follow a developer on GitHub and now I have a feed of some of the most interesting things that are happening in the software space because the algorithm is giving me that information based on who I follow. So there's all types of ways that you can integrate social features into apps that don't necessarily have to be a social app in the front and forward main selling point. And Lens basically allows you to do that. Lens is at the core a set of smart contracts deployed to Polygon, but what really makes Lens powerful, I think, uh, as a developer is more about how easy it is to build with. We have a lot of different things that you can use that kind of abstract away the traditional complexity of building on a blockchain. We have 
a GraphQL API that allows you to query it like you would a database. So you can say, give me profiles that have been created, like for instance, at a certain point in time, or that might have, uh, you might be able to search publications and sort and filter and all these things that you can do with the database. Our API allows you to do that. We also have a lot of interesting SDKs and developer tooling and things like that that allow you to build much quickly, more quickly than you would that by calling like just raw API requests that I'm gonna show in just a moment as well. Um, for UX, for the actual user facing things that we've built into the protocol that make it kind of more of a desirable place to build than just directly on chain is our gasless transactions and our dispatcher. Gasless transactions basically mean that the user doesn't have to pay for anything. So when a traditional like blockchain application is launched and you want to get a user to use that, the onboarding flow is actually very, very, very bad. You have to explain to that person that you, they need to download this wallet and they need to create a private key. They need to go to the bank and they need to open uh, an account and then they need to connect that account to an exchange like Coinbase. Then they need to write, buy the right token. Then they need to send that right token to the wallet and be on the right network and then exchange for whatever token it is that that up, that that works on, right? That, that's a shitload of friction, right? Um, users are like very hard to come by already. And when you put all this additional friction, that's kind of uh, a no-brainer why most blockchain applications don't have any users. If you think about building in the traditional Web2 world, people literally make onboarding seamless as clicking on a button to sign up with Google, and they still can't get users. So I think that making this onboarding process as smooth as possible and not requiring all this is a super important. So with Lens applications, the user doesn't need tokens. They just need a wallet and then they can start using the app for free. And the reason that it's free is because we've upgraded and improved our infrastructure that I'm gonna talk about in just a moment to make transactions super, super cheap on an order of magnitude of a traditional database, a couple of orders of magnitude, uh, which makes it very, very inexpensive. I'll, I'll show you some numbers in just a moment. And then also our dispatcher at the API level allows you to just sign a single transaction saying, I can post using this account without having to sign every other transaction going forward. So the end UX ends up being more of something like Twitter. And I will try to kind of show an app in just a moment. And then de the developer experience is something that I'm going to show in just a moment as well. So one of the things that has been a challenge for building this type of application in Web3 is, is the scalability. If you look at a database like DynamoDB, I used to work at AWS for a little over three years. We had applications that literally would uh, be able to handle, uh, that, that did handle around 100 million operations per second for a single application. We have blockchains that are supposedly scalable that can't even hit a few thousand transactions per second. And this is a shared environment. Like not only that, that, up, that, that blockchain can only handle a few thousand TPS, but that is being distributed between every application ever launched to that blockchain and every single user on every single application that's launched that blockchain. Clearly not a good use case for social. And I think that we're starting to see a lot of improvement in, in this space with um, uh, you know, app chains and things like that, that I think are gonna be great. But even with that today, you cannot build using a traditional, what I would call a financial blockchain that has the limitations around fixing the double spin problem, which turns out in social doesn't even matter because who cares if me and my friend post at the exact same time. The only thing that we care about is that that content is going to be there, it's going to be immutable, and it's gonna be available for people to kind of use and be, be able to read publicly. So removing the constraint of the double spin problem allows you to use a protocol like Arweave, and um, Arweave is a protocol that's built specifically for data storage, and it's not built for financial use cases. It's more just built to store files and stuff. So our new infrastructure uses um, Arweave, and it's called Momoka. And at the last time that I checked, we had hit around 800,000 TPS, I mean 800,000 transactions for a total cost of $261. I've paid $261 for a single ETH transaction during the bull market. So this is 786,000 times more scalable than that one transaction that I did. Obviously, that's not the typical cost. The typical cost for a, a transaction on like a, a new L2 is probably closer to like a few cents, but still we are orders of magnitude cheaper than that. 
Um, and therefore, it makes it easy for us to be able to subsidize all the transactions on the network at this cost. Now, in terms of developer experience, we have the GraphQL API that I talked about a moment ago, but we also have SDKs. So we have the Lens SDK, which is both a React Hooks SDK and an agnostic JavaScript SDK. The React Hooks SDK just allows you to call APIs with two lines of code. The Lens client is a more agnostic JavaScript SDK that also allows you to kind of uh, make requests with just a few lines of code. It sits above the Lens API. So instead of having to understand and format GraphQL, you can just say, give me publications or give me a profile with this ID, two lines of code, you have that data back and ready to roll. Whoops, this is what the API uh, looks like. So you just import the hook and then you uh, render data loading and error, which kind of gets returned from you there. And you also can pass in arguments for uh, different props, things like sorting and filtering and stuff like that. We have a UI kit for React Native. You can get started with two lines of code as well. You can render a feed, you can render a publication, you can render a profile, all sorts of stuff. And then we have a widgets library. This is kind of an, uh, an idea of what those widgets look like when you render those out. You have a way to share profiles. We have a, a, way, a way to share content. You have a way to sign in with Lens using it. Um, more of like a, as an integration, which is what most of the time these widgets are used for. But it's also just a really simple way to kind of get started with Lens uh, using just a couple of lines of code. Um, and then finally, something that a lot of people have been building some of the most interesting stuff with is our BigQuery data set. So with, uh, with our BigQuery data set, I think we have like 65 or 70 tables that allow you to literally query every piece of data in the history of Lens in a fairly short amount of time. And with this, people are building things like analytics dashboards and recommendation algorithms. And then we integrate really, really closely with XNTP. There's a Lens namespace that allow you to kind of integrate with every other Lens app. So if I send a DM on Orb and then someone else opens it on Butterfly and then you build a new app, you'll have all of those DM conversations integrated into your app without having to do much work. Um, a couple of the core features of Lens that I think are super important to highlight that aren't really specific to Lens, it's more of like a Web3 thing, but I will just underscore them because they really shine with Lens. One of them is extensibility. So with uh, Lens, and especially with Lens V2, which was just uh, launched to test that a couple of days ago, you can build your own custom functionality with custom modules and what we call open actions. With these new features, or with that new feature, open actions, and with custom modules, you can basically, it would be like if you could submit a pull request to Twitter and add a feature that you wanted, you can do that with Lens. So if you see something that you want that isn't already there, you can kind of integrate this. And this also opens the doors to a lot of cross-chain stuff. So we're already starting to partner with some other protocols that are outside of the Polygon network that allow you to interact and integrate with, uh, with their applications and vice versa. Um, and then there's this idea of composability. Composability is a big thing with smart contracts because anyone can just build on top of each other's contracts and you have all of this DeFi stuff that happened and there's all types of stuff you can do that. But beyond that, I think it's important to underscore that the protocol itself is almost more of a managed infrastructure service like you would see with traditional cloud providers because not only do all of these things exist, they continue to be maintained and improved over time. And you as a developer only have to focus on the front end. So you can be a front end developer building web or mobile apps and not have to build and manage DevOps, infrastructure, database, all of this other stuff. And um, you also inherit the existing Lens user base. So you don't have to kind of bootstrap and cold start as bad uh, as you would from a traditional application. You still have a little bit of a cold start problem because you have to get awareness of your app. But once people know about it, it's not like they have to sign up for a new profile. If they already have a Lens profile, they already have their followers on your application as well. And one of the things that we're doing now that Lens V2 has been rolled out essentially is we're opening up Lens protocol to be completely open for, uh, I would say, more of a permissionless uh, access for new users. So as a closed beta, it's been hard for people to get handles. They have to go through this process but very soon we're gonna have a way for developers to be able to onboard users directly through their applications without uh, any involvement from the, the, the protocol at all. Um, the composability for developers was spoken for there. For users, it's interesting because for me as a, as a user, I have this portable social graph 
and I can focus on building my audience on one of these applications. But if I see a new application that launches tomorrow that I like a lot, I now have all of my followers there and I can experiment and try things out there without having to kind of worry about bootstrapping from scratch. So LensTube, Orb launches, and then I see this new app that is called Butterfly. Okay, this is pretty cool. Every time I sign into a new app, all of my followers are there. And this is a really fun experience from the user perspective. And I don't think a lot of creators kind of like that. For the tech stack as a front end developer, because you are not having to build the back end, this is kind of the tech stack you might work with. Uh, GraphQL and the Lens API, one of those SDKs that I just showed you, you still need to manage your metadata for a post. So when you publish some content to Lens, you can choose where that needs to be stored. So you can either store on IPFS or Arweave. We recommend Bundler with Arweave. Um, you can also integrate video streaming features with LivePeer. We see a lot of people doing that. And you'll still be using some of the same SDKs that you've used in the past. Things like Rainbow Kit, uh, Wallet Connect, Ethers, Wagme, and uh, on the front end, you can use any of the libraries that you've used in the past, like Next.js, uh, React Native, uh, whatever. Okay, so tried to go through that kind of quickly so we could get to an actual demo. What I want to do is just show you how to build a uh, social app in, uh, I don't know, five minutes, I guess. So what we're gonna start with is the Lens Docs. So if you wanna get started, we have developer quick start right here. Um, this is a great place to get started building out what we're about to build now. And this is actually the guide that I'm gonna be following. What I have built out so far for this demonstration, for this demo, is just a blank Next.js application. Literally nothing there, we're starting from scratch. And what I would like to, to duplicate is a experience similar to what we might see on Lensster, which is a Lens client or something like Twitter. And most, Social applications have two types of views. You have a feed of publications and you have a feed of people, right? Like if you think about almost every application that you've ever used, you have those two main components. You click on a profile, you see a feed of publications from that user. You click some type of recommendation algorithm, you see a feed of publications from random users. You click on a user's profile and you want to see their followers and you have now this feed of followers. So we're talking about feeds of publications and feeds of followers. We want to start our application from either one of those points. So for this demo, we're going to start with the feed of users. Um, there's a couple of ways I can do that here in my code base. The first thing I'm going to do is just show you the widgets where I can maybe import a feed of publications from the widgets for React. And I'm going to delete all of this code. And I'm gonna drop in this like pre-made UI component, which this isn't the main thing. We're gonna actually use the regular SDK, but this is just a fun demo because I can just pass in a handle for like Christina who is here. And I can just save that. And I should be able to go here to my app and refresh. Oh, I need to uh, use use clients for the new Next.js because it's like really, really awesome like that. They just assumed everyone's building server side apps now. Um, anyway, so now we see a feed of Christina's publications and we got this uh, done in just uh, one line of code. This is very extensible as well. So I can actually pass in a lot of different props to most of these components to do things like, let's say I want to theme it and uh, I want to set the theme to the dark theme, now the dark theme. Um, there's about seven or eight different, um, I would say, types of UI components that we can uh, build with that widgets library. But what we actually want to have is more control. We just want the data in itself and then we can build out the styling ourselves. So instead of using the widgets library, what I'm gonna um, instead use is the uh, React Lens SDK. And I'm going to import Explorer Profiles. And in our component here, I can just render the 
uh, data from invoking the use explore profiles and I can log that out. Now, if I go to inspect my element here, I see that I have an array of data that has come back with profiles that are given to us based on a very basic recommendation algorithm because we haven't passed any arguments to that. It's just kind of given us the default. But you, say, you see that we have like a bio of a user, we have their handle, we have their profile picture, we have stats, we have all types of stuff about them. And I can even go here and I can pass in an argument that says limit like 30 or 40, whatever, because right now we're only getting back 10. And then now we see um, once this is refreshed that we have 30 profiles coming back. Okay, cool. So now that we have that, what I'm going to do is go to the quick start guide and I'm gonna follow along and I want to um, essentially loop over those profiles and show the profile picture, maybe their bio, and then a link to the profile details. So I'm just going to copy all of this code here, and then we're going to walk through that. So instead of returning that, you're going to rename data to profiles. And then we're going to import link from next link. And we're basically um, mapping over the profiles array. For each profile, we're returning a profile picture, a profile handle, and a profile bio. And if I go ahead here and I refresh, we now have a um, pretty ugly but we at least have a working functional social app that's that we have gotten got started. So what I want to do next though is uh, if I go to Twitter or like Leinster, I can click on a profile and view their deep profile details. So I want to build out that feature in my app. So what I can do now is if you look at the link that I've created here, it links to a page called slash profile. Profile doesn't exist. So what we need to do is go here to create a new folder called profile. And then in the profile, we're going to create a route called handle. And then in handle, we can create a file called page.tsx. And with page, <clears throat> excuse me, with this page, I'm going to get the params from the route which are passed in as an argument. And we can now use that params that is essentially going to be slash profile slash ID or handle to fetch an individual profile. Um, and instead of writing that from my own head, I'm gonna go to the developer quick start and continue there. So the hooks that we're using here are gonna be a little different. We have use profile use publications and uh, profile. So I guess I need to call this profile component. Um, the profile is for, for, type, for TypeScript typings, but these two are actual hooks that we're gonna use. Um, because we need to first get the profile using the params handle. And then once we have that handle, we can get the publications for that user. Because what we wanna render is this view here where we show their profile information, but also their publications. So the way that we're gonna do that is we're gonna create two components. One is going to be the profile component that I will actually just copy here. And the profile component is going to call use profile using the handle that's in the params and it's gonna return um, very similar to our other page where we have like the profile picture, the handle, and the bio. And then we're going to create a new component called publications that's going to invoke the use publications hook. Publications is rendered here if there is a profile. Once that profile is available, we're going to call use publications, and this is going to 
uh, return a limit of, we set here of 10. And we're gonna then map over the publications to render out uh, the publication. If it has an image, we'll render the image. If it's just text, we'll render the text. All right, chances are I broke something here, but we'll try this. So now what I should be able to do is just click on a profile and then we should be able to then uh, view that profile and their um, profile information. <laughs> um, that's the demo. What I want to do to close this out is make a quick post. Um, okay, cool. So I'm going to go ahead and open Warp. Oh, the camera's not working. Oh, yeah, wait, yeah, it is. There we go. Okay, so this is a Lens app called Orb. And um, in it, there is an ETH Global New York community. So what I'm going to do is take a quick picture. And post it here. Well, it's not connected anymore, but I'll still uh, do that. Okay, so do you want to be in the picture? Well, you don't have a choice. Cheese. <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to do then, I guess I can just post it here and show it on Linster. So I'm posting on Orb, and we'll, we'll just... Uh, also have this show up in the developer community, but also just in the public. All right, it just posted, and I'm gonna give it a couple seconds and then refresh. And there we are. Um, that's the beauty of being able to kind of like have this social graph. I can post on any application that I want, and it'll probably be viewable on the application that you like the most. So to wrap it up, I want to show a couple of uh, links. Um, well, when we talk about the bounties, we have $10,000 in Lens bounties. We also have $10,000 in, in Aave Go bounties, or, or not we, but the Aave Foundation uh, does. $4,000 for best Lens app, $2,500 for most original Lens app, $2,500 for best social file Lens app, and $500 times two for best integrations. Uh, another view to the links. And uh, with that, I'll wrap it up. Thank you for checking out the workshop. <laughs>